an epistemological nightmare. That's Ooh. what Ash created for yeah. people. Welcome to the Manipulation Check with Dr. Jeff Spence and Dr. Dan Smilek. They are just two academics with PhDs in psychology trying to make sense of the world. Come and listen to the conversation. All right, Jeff, we should begin by thanking our listeners and our viewers uh, for sharing our content and for the fantastic comments people are posting. And yeah. we've also received some emails uh, of encouragement and, and people suggesting different content that maybe we should cover in future episodes. So we want to thank everybody for that. And we want to ask people to uh, please continue to share our channel with those you think who might be interested. Okay, Jeff, what's our focus for today? All right, we got a good one today. We're going to talk about some psychological research that would give some uh, illumination to some experiences people may have had throughout the pandemic and pandemic res pandemic response where you may be seeing things that don't make sense. So you okay. may be seeing logical people, rational people acting in potentially illogical and irrational ways. Um, and it's hard to understand what's, what's going on. You may even recognize it in yourself where you see you're doing something or you've done something that you said, I don't think that doesn't make sense. It, it doesn't, it's not consistent with what I would have thought would have, with what I would have expected. I'm doing something. I'm thinking something that's inconsistent with my, with my senses, what's been perceived or your preexisting attitudes. Mm -hmm. And it's something that, um, it's been talked about a little bit. Um, it's, I think it's grow, it's growing in its popularity with respect to trying to understand the pandemic and people's responses to it. Uh, specifically this idea of mass, uh, mass formation psychosis. Yeah. So Desmond so stuff. Yes. Matthias Desmond. Exactly. So I think one of the reasons why it's resonating so much with people is because it's providing some answers to some questions they may have had with respect to, so why is this happening? Why is what I'm seeing not making any sense? So why, why does it look like people are acting in these crazy ways, let's say. Mm -hmm. And one of the, one of the, uh, the understanding of, of the word psychosis is basically a detachment, a, a, a separation from reality. So you're seeing, rea so reality is one way and people are acting a different way. It's like they're out of touch with reality. So the research we want to talk about speaks to some of these processes, um, but it's more foundational. It's more fundamental to psychological research. You know, it's, it's really, um, you know, it's, it's really stuff that anybody, everybody in psychology knows. Uh, and specifically what we want to look at today is the topic of conformity and the psychology yes. of conformity. So we want to get into some of the seminal research on conformity um, and understand how it can be applied to the pandemic, how it can be used to help us understand what's going on, provide us a framework, some understanding, some language and vocabulary to understand what's going on with respect to how people are behaving, specifically the relation between how people behave in re relation to, let's say, reality. Ah, Does that okay. make sense? Yeah. And the, uh, the studies we specifically want to talk about are those that were reported by Solomon Ash in the early 1950s, the Ash yes. uh, conformity studies. And it's very interesting. And I'd point our, our viewers and our listeners, listeners to a paper that was published in the Scientific American, Scientific American November 1955, titled Opinions and Social Pressure by Solomon Ash. And there he summarizes a lot of the work that he had done on conformity. And, you know, right in the, on the first page in his introduction, he actually talks about things like hypnosis and the prior literature on suggestibility. So he's actually referencing all of that earlier theoretical work and some empirical work as the background work for his own studies. And he even talks about this, and, and I know you you drew my attention to this, Jeff, the engineering of consent, mm -hmm. okay? And he yeah. writes, uh, the same epoch that had witnessed the unprecedented technical extension of communication has also brought into existence the deliberate manipulation, ooh, manipulation check, of opinion <laughs> And the engineering of consent, the deliberate manipulation of opinion and the engineering of consent. And he talks about hypnosis and then the work on suggestibility. And then he brings the reader to uh, his own work on the, on the topic. So, uh, yeah, very foundational, very relevant. But let's talk about yeah. these ASH studies. Yeah. So 
Ash created this very interesting conflict, okay, which he ca characterized in a very particular way. And let me just find uh, the, the paper here. This is from his uh, 1951 paper that was reprinted in 1952. And I think I have the reprinted version here. And he writes the following. The critical subject was submitted to two contradictory and irreconcilable forces. The evidence of his own experience of an utterly clear perceptual fact and the unanimous evidence of a group of equals. Okay, so the conflict here is between your own perceptual experience and the claims about that experience by a group and they're unanimous in their different version. And uh, Jeff, I have a video clip here from an early documentary. So let me just play that for you. It tells a little bit of the method and, and also the main finding. The experiment you'll be taking part in today involves the perception of lengths of lines. As you can see here, I have a number of cards, and on each card there are several lines. Your task is a very simple one. You're to look at the line on the left and determine which of the three lines on the right is equal to it in length. All right, we'll proceed in this order. You'll give your answer. Only one of the people in the group is a real subject, the fifth person with the white t-shirt. The others are confederates of the experimenter and have been told to give wrong answers on some of the trials. The experiment begins uneventfully as subjects give their judgments. Two, 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 two. three, 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 three. But on the third trial, something happens. Two. 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 Uh, two. The subject denies the evidence of his own eyes and yields to group influence. One. Ash found subjects went along with the group on 37% of the critical trials. So there you go. So just to reiterate very quickly, in case our viewers and listeners missed that, so participants in the study are shown a reference line on the left, and then they're shown three lines of different lengths on the right, and only one line on the right matches the line on the left, and then participants have to say aloud which of the lines on the right matches the line on the left. Now, critically, there are two conditions in, in this study. In one condition... The participant makes the judgments alone with the experimenter. So they're just by themselves. You can think of that as a control condition. And then critically, in the other condition, this would be the conformity condition, participants make their judgments in the presence of a group. And this happens to be a group of confederates. These, the, all the group members go first always. But on some of the trials, they report the wrong answer and they systematically, consistently all report the wrong answer in the, in the critical experiment. And the question is, when it comes to the participant to respond, will they conform to the group or will they remain independent and report what, they're ac what they actually see? So that, that's the main setup of the experiment. Jeff, do you want to elaborate on that and tell us the main finding? So yeah, main findings here... One of the things that comes out of Ash is basically the emergence of three types of people. So you get people who conform quite readily and consistently. Mm -hmm. and then you get people who are independent and remain independent. Mm -hmm. So virtually no conform, no conformity at all. Yep. And then you get people in the middle that do a little bit of both. Mm -hmm. So some specific numbers, the, the, the video referenced the 30, um, it was a 37%. Mm -hmm. of people gave incorrect responses. 37% of the trials, people gave incorrect responses. So one of the things that's happening here is you get participants responding to repeated stimuli. Right. And it's an aggregation across all participants, across all the stimuli. How many times did they capitulate to the group? Mm -hmm. And the other thing that's important to note is not every single trial was a trial where the group was wrong. So in every case, there, in every case where there's a deviation between reality and the um, and what the group is saying, the group is always well. It goes without saying the group is always wrong in its deviation from um, from the target from the target line. So the participant, what the participant is seeing, is always correct, and it's always clearly correct. If that makes right. sense. Right. 
Yeah, so it's it's very obvious because the the difference in sizes between the lines were like in a matter of just over an inch in some cases, right? So yeah. so it's like very perceptible. So there's yeah. an objective, clear reality, and the group is an error relative to that reality. So to put some to put some numbers to that, in the control group that you mentioned where there was no group influence at all, ninety nine percent of responses were correct. So there were ah. some mistakes, there were some errors, but every mm -hmm. time the participants were correctly identifying the line of equal length with the exception right. of, I believe it was three, three instances where there were, there was, there was some mistakes. Yeah. So generally what we find is, or what Ash found was the emergence of these three, three groups. So overall we see about 27% of people gave either eight between eight and 12 conforming responses. Mm -hmm. So the maximum mm -hmm. number of conforming responses there could have been was 12. So some people went to the max, other people went as high as eight. So 27% of people conformed eight to 12 on eight to 12 of the trials. So what they saw was one thing, the group said something else, they went along eight to 12 out of a possible 12 um, yep. times. Of, on the on the flip side, twenty four percent of people didn't capitulate one time, so they stayed independent all the way through every single trial. They said what they thought was right. So you can imagine they, all this all this group pressure, and there's still a group of people here who always dissent and always go with what they see. Always go right. So you can see. So it's very public. It's public. Mm -hmm. the the cons uh, the con the group consensus always comes first. Everybody says the same thing and then it comes to the participant and the participant has to declare publicly and 24% of people repeatedly every single trial. So the next line comes up and next line comes up. They go against the group. They go against the group. They go against the group. It's also important to mention that the group wasn't wrong every time. Ah, right. So right. there was some, there was, there's a number of trials where the group gave correct responses interspersed yeah. throughout. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But in the times where they were wrong, these independents stayed independent. And then there was the 50, 50 some odd percent that were giving a mix of conforming responses and independent responses. Yes. So generally speaking, we can interpret the results as pointing to the emergence of these, let's say three, three types, three types of responses or three types of people, perhaps, if you want to say it that mm -hmm. way, mm -hmm. where you get the conforming, you get the independence, and then you get the people who are kind of in between. That the majority of people are in between. Times. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Conforming sometimes and not other times. Exactly. For those. So some yeah. sometimes this result, this, this research has been interpreted through the lens of seventy percent of people, for example, seventy six percent of people conformed at least once. Because you're grouping together those who conformed all the time and those who conform sometimes. Exactly. And so you're, you're taking those together and then you get this big number and you're like, oh my goodness, people just conform under- People under, conform, <laughs> yeah. Look how even, many people conform. Even when the reality is clear, look exactly. how many people conform. Yeah, exactly. Wow. But there's another way you can look at it too, right? Which is the other way, which is you can look at the people who are stay independent. Yep. Exactly. And so you could cut it with a 24% of people stay independent. That's a sizable proportion of people. Yeah. You know, and that, like you said, it's in the face of quite a lot of social pressure. You got to say it publicly. There's no incentive. Yeah. They're and not, you don't get rewarded to be independent. Right. You don't get punished either, but it's, it's a relatively neutral environment in that way. So the only thing that's exerting pressure on the individuals is that group influence. Yeah. So so what you can say is you can re really come up with two interesting but different stories. One of them is is that hey, look, even though the evidence out there is clear and the group is wrong, there's a large proportion of people who will conform at some point. And then the other way you can think about this is that even though there's so much group pressure and you're the only one that's sticking out of the crowd, right. There is still going to be a proportion of people, maybe a quarter of the people that are always going to stay independent. And and maybe if you then add in those people who conform sometimes, you say that is even a bigger group that sometimes stay independent. So, yeah. yeah. And then you could even look at it at the trial 
at the trial level. So you see, you saw the 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 uh, at the end of the video clip there, the, it was the percentages was provided based on how in how many trials right. were people correct or, or yes, incorrect. That's right. Yeah, and then you could see even in that even in that clip, the emphasis there was thirty seven percent of trials people were incorrect. Right. Okay. So well, what's go. the what's the inverse of that? How many times were they correct? The yes. amount of times they were correct was a bigger number than the amount of times they were incorrect. However, the emphasis tends to be it's the Ash, Solomon Ash conformity studies, not yeah. the Solomon Ash conformity and independence studies. Yeah, so you can think of it both as conformity and independence. Let's come back to that. So make sure mm -hmm. you, you come back to that by the, by the end of the episode. Um, but yeah, is there anything else you want to highlight before we, we, we move on here? Yeah, so one thing to highlight is a term that, that was used, so it was introduced by a, a researcher named named Brown, and he described what's happening in the ASH studies, that what ASH has done is, is he's created this epistemological nightmare. Right. For participants. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so participants are being put in this, in this situation where reality, <laughs> as they see it, is being questioned. And it's being questioned by this by this group of people. And any sort of typical assumptions about how, let's say, things work socially with respect to the figuring out of what's what's going on is getting violated. Yeah. So a fundamental conflict is happening between what people are seeing mm -hmm. with their own eyes and what the social environment other people are telling them. Yeah. And there's no way to resolve that conflict in in this in this paradigm. Yes. Now, presumably, um, you get this certain degree of conformity when the objective reality is clear. But you might imagine that you get a lot more conformity when the objective reality is less clear, right? Where there's more uncertainty in there, or when the judgment, or if the judgment task is more difficult. And mm -hmm. I think there's some evidence that shows if you give people a harder judgment task, they're more likely to go with the answer of the group. Right. And, and it turns out, uh, Jeff, that uh, under conditions of uncertainty, people even conform to the views of robots. People conform to robots. And uh, I have a title here of a, of a study uh, from a group out of Yale University. And the title is Humans Conform to Robots. Disambiguating from the title. <laughs> yeah. Disambiguating trust, truth, and conformity. And uh, yeah, they basically had uh, participants respond to a, a series of stimuli, make judgments on a series of stimuli. And, you know, they did it alone or they did it, they gave their final answer after um, some robots would give their answers. You can think of it, I guess, like AIs would, would give their answers. And here's what they found. They write, therefore, we have shown that groups of robots can cause people to conform to them. Additionally, trust plays a role in conformity. Initially, participants conform to robots at a similar rate to Ash's participants. Hey, see, they particularly reference Ash there. However, many participants stop conforming later in the game when trust is lost due to the robots choosing an incorrect answer. So there's a very interesting element here of, of trust, right? But imagine that uh, in the future, when we start to have AIs that work very well, artificial intelligences, and we start to trust them, or will we conform to their judgments? If all the artificial intelligence systems give the same response, if there's yeah. consensus. <laughs> That's right. There's got to be consensus among the robots, yeah. but like, among why not, robots. right? What happens if the robots disagree with you? <laughs> it's going to be the same company programming all the robots. <laughs> there's going to be agreement. <laughs> but that's a really good that's a really good opportunity to talk about conformity specifically and what it is and maybe different reasons for it. So a couple of reasons for conformity that people have talked about is basically one's like an informational conformity. So let's say mm -hmm. it's ambiguous, you're not really sure. So you're gonna go along with the group because that's kind of a safe bet. That's maybe the most rational position, mm -hmm. right? And then there's more of a social dynamic too where you you perceive it as one way for sure like in the ash study let's say for example not to say this was exactly what was happening in ash but that there's unambiguous stimuli unambiguous answer attitude norm behavior what have you um and people do it for social reasons you want to be accepted you don't want to be excluded you don't want to be 
um, looked down upon or seen as some kind of deviant from the group. So there's kind of an informational yeah. mechanism as well as a, as a social, social mechanism. But one of the things that specifically, um, or there's many definitions of conformity, but one of the ones that I think is most helpful to understand how we're, how we're talking about it today and possible applications to the pandemic and the pandemic response is it specifically implies or requires or, or entails a movement. So it's a movement of attitude. It's a movement of behavior. A change. A change. So what one would typically do to one in which they're going along with a contradictory position that aligns with a group of people. Mm, mm, so mm. It, it, it requires, or let's say entails this movement, this change from one's own position to a different position. And that's very yeah. different than let's say going along with, you know, so, social norms, um, where you, you go along, it's what we do. It's things that happen. It's very different when you say, okay, I, if I was left alone, I would be doing this definite thing. And I feel some pressure, whether real or perceived, to change that and to do something else that aligns with the aligns with the with the group. Right. So let, let's let's just put this in the context, maybe of of the current, you know, pandemic and the vaccine situation. Right. So if you're someone who's like, I want to take the vaccine because I think it's it's good for me, it's good for all of us, and you take the vaccine, even though you're going along with the group, that's not conformity because exactly. you didn't start out with a different position. But then there are those people who are like, I don't want to take this vaccine. I don't, you know, it's not good for me and I don't think it should be mandated, but I'm going to do it anyways because I'm going to be socially ostracized. There might be maybe other penalties that might come into play, even though in Astor, we're, we're no penalties, but presumably there's social pressure uh, kind of conveying some social penalties, right? Um, mm -hmm. But at least the, the key point here is that you need the change. You got to go from an initial position. You got to change that, that position. Um, yeah. And Jeff, we and should in also response to some kind of pressure or perceived, perceived pressure. Yeah, from from the social group, I guess. Yeah, and uh, that could be, case. you know, that could be any. So people could have experienced this in any number of ways, um, where you'd be looking at something, you'd be seeing something, you hear a report, you hear about some data, you're looking at it, you draw a certain conclusion, and then you open your window, you step outside, and you see everybody else seems to be taking it in a different direction. Yeah. And that could exactly. have happened any, maybe any number of times or maybe every day since, since this started, maybe, maybe it's been happening. Mm -hmm. Now, Jeff, we should also maybe distinguish conformity from obedience to authority, um, mm. which we discussed in our first episode of the show. Remember the Milgram studies and, uh, actually Milgram discusses conformity and Asha studies in his book. So everybody will remember, uh, the book. And uh, he has essentially four distinguishing features uh, that distinguish conformity from obedience. And the first one is hierarchy. So in the obedience paradigm, you have a clear hierarchical relationship between the uh, teacher and the experimenter, right? The experimenter is superordinate to the teacher. Whereas in the conformity studies, ASHA studies, you have no hierarchy. Participants are just among peers. Okay, so that's number one. The second one is is the role of imitation. And uh, um, Milgram's argument is that imitation is present in conformity because you start to imitate the group, whereas that doesn't really play a role in the obedience studies. And the third distinction he brings up is explicitness. And he argues that uh, in the obedience situation, going along is kind of an explicitly stated norm, like you're there to do what the experimenter tells you to do. Whereas in the conformity situation, going along is more implicit. You're never actually directed to go along with the group. It's just this implicit pressure. And the final one that he has is voluntarism or sense of autonomy. And I think I want to quote, uh, just to make sure I get this one right, quote right from his book. So he writes the following. Thus, while the conforming subject insists that his autonomy was not impaired by the group, the obedient subject asserts that he had no autonomy in the matter of shocking the victim and that his actions were completely out of his own hands. So in, in the obedience paradigm, remember you're saying, I have no autonomy and you're shifting responsibility onto the experimenter, onto the authority. Whereas in these conformity studies, people will actually say that they retain their autonomy. 
and uh, that they've decided they've now made the choice of responding this way. So those are the four main differences. Um, and, and I think I would add one to that, which I might call conflict type. And the basic idea here is that in the obedience paradigm, there's a conflict, but it's between your values of uh, not hurting somebody, somebody and the value of obeying authority. Okay, so that's mm. the conflict that, that uh, Milgram sets up. Whereas in the conformity paradigm, Ash sets up a different conflict, which is between your experience of reality and the reality expressed by the group. So it's kind of it's kind of interesting. They both set up conflicts, but they're of a different kind. An epistemological nightmare. That's Ooh. what Ash created for yeah. people. Yeah. So you have this epistemological nightmare, nightmare, this conflict. Let's let's apply that to this pandemic scenario, to the COVID-19 situation, because I don't know about other people, but I've certainly had these moments during this COVID situation, it started happening pretty early on, where I would look at actual data, and and I would I would I would create an opinion about uh, the pandemic situation, and then I would find that it just completely mismatches. It doesn't match at all with what the media is saying and what others around me are saying, and uh, or or the policies that were being implemented. Okay, so it was this huge mismatch, and and I had that exact epistemological nightmare going on, yeah. right? Like, what am I am I seeing this incorrectly, right? And 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 what am I missing in this situation? Um, and I can give some examples of this. So, for instance, like right, very early on, the stats were showing that you know if you're below seventy years of age um, and otherwise healthy, like you weren't overweight and so on, there's a very low likelihood of ending up in the hospital from COVID or experiencing any serious consequences. You know, but if you if you follow the media, you would think that it, like everybody was at risk and we're all going to die, you know, if we don't stop this virus in its tracks. Yeah, it's a certainty that if you get it, you're going to virtual certainty if you get it, you're going to end up in the hospital. That's hospitalized right. Hospitalized or life threatening. Yeah. And and I remember uh, actually even Bill Maher uh, mentioned this, a poll that was done and uh, something like 50% mm. of the people believe that like if you get COVID, you end up in the hospital, right? Or, yeah. or some, or if you get COVID, 50% of the people would end up in the hospital or something like that, right? Uh, mm -hmm. So these, these crazy numbers. Um, and, you know, you give other examples. So children, for instance, the data show that they're at very low risk. And uh, so you would imagine you just leave them alone. So uh, that's your no, line. You're seeing the line. You're seeing, <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's right. The line is three inches tall you're gonna only. Match, you're going to match that perception with the line that says, therefore... Therefore, you got to isolate the children. You got to you got to vaccinate the children. You got to yeah. do all these things because they're in danger of COVID, or they are they are a danger maybe to society and so on. So, again, it's like a, just a totally different take on what I perceive reality to be. You know, Omicron that has come recently is a it's an excellent example, right? Because you know it's infecting the vaxxed, it's infecting the unvaxxed. It doesn't seem to be a discriminatory <laughs> virus with regard to vaccination. Um, yeah, people are doubling down on the vaccine mandates. And it's like, you got it. Right. We got to do more. And, you know, there's more to say about that because there's been a narr uh, narrative shift, right? From the fact that the vaccines prevent infection spread to they're going to prevent, you know, extreme illness. Uh, but uh, the whole justification of vaccine mandates is that the vaccines prevent infection and spread. Uh, but Omicron has totally blown that out of the water. But yet you see people still pushing the vaccine mandates. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. And I think the one that probably struck me the most was in terms of the response, right? Is in terms of the vaccine mandates, because, you know, my reality was sort of grounded in all of our historical medical codes that we've had. And in terms of the human rights code and and our very robust tradition of protecting bodily autonomy of the individual and then all of a sudden at the snap of a finger we totally throw that out the door out mm -hmm. the window and so you're coming uh, in with your with your human rights code line yeah you're going to apply it over here to the target lines and then yeah. everybody's saying two 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 yeah exactly and you're and at the end of the line saying what? <laughs> it's four. Isn't it four? I thought that's we agreed. Right. <laughs> guys, it's four. That's right. It's four, guys. Yeah. And, and you, there, there, there are so many examples of persistent denial of naturally acquired immunity, for instance. Like there's so mm -hmm. much evidence out there that 
if you've had COVID, you have natural immunity. It's, it's very robust, right? But it's almost like that doesn't count at all mm-hmm. for- You're uh, saying one, one, and they're saying three, yeah. three. <laughs> yeah. Um, That's the epistemological nightmare. Did you have such such ash moments? Oh, Jeff? those are all, I would <laughs> concur with you on all those. I have, I have a few others. <laughs> the one, the big one for me, the right, right away, early days, ash moment and still hasn't left me. I'm still living in the night. I'm still living in the nightmare. Yeah. <laughs> Is the use of the term cases. Oh, so yeah. So I'm a yeah, measurement yeah. guy. I teach psychometrics and equating a positive test with a case that's the nightmare has begun <laughs> and then everybody so you're 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 looking at i'm looking at the line and i'm seeing positive test and then everybody's over here saying case 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 yeah so right, equation, right equating a positive test with a case is completely you know that's a complete deviation and that that's, that's right and it's continued and it keeps going <laughs> no one's yeah stopped. and there, there was a bunch there that were um that were all intertwined right so uh also defining a case in terms of a symptomatic uh infection versus just an, cases is yeah that's a, right which would previously you would if so you, you were case, yeah you would have had a disease and actually the actual symptoms um and that would be distinct different from having an infection of something right so so i, I, I a classic example is um you know you'd have hiv but uh, you wouldn't have AIDS necessarily, right? You were an AIDS case if you had HIV. But you see all these lines started to blur and people started, yeah. And, and it's like, what's your sense of reality is constantly being being challenged, especially in those cases, because th- there's complexity and there's ambiguity in the, some of those case, uh, s- situations, right? Uh, and so, so- Yeah, sometimes. And other times, yeah, like let's say historically or conventionally up until, you know, 2020, a rough, let's say a rough definition of like what a case would be, would be something like somebody who requires treatment. Right. So you have, you have a certain ailment or what have you, and you require treatment in your case. Yeah, that's right. And then we're going to administer a test to diagnose. And that test could be, you know, depending on the test, depending on the situation, it can be accurate to varying degrees, right? Yeah. Yeah. So the, the exact reason why you don't equate a case with a positive test is that tests aren't perfect. Tests can be wrong. Exactly. Yeah. So, but that's, yeah, that's. Yeah. And, and also. I'll, I'll equate the, that to, as people, have people seen the movie, you know, uh, the, what, what's it called? Inception. Right. And uh, this could be an old reference. I don't know. And everybody's got their little personal thing they have that tells them if they're in a dream or not during a nightmare. Okay. If it, if it behaves a certain I, way. Yeah. You know what? I don't know if it's a good reference. <laughs> I, I, to, I have this vague memory of the whole thing. That spin, so that, that thing where you spin it and only you know what it is, the, the case positive test distinction, that's my, that's my spinning top to know that I'm still, <laughs> as long as that's right. happening, I know I'm still in a nightmare. <laughs> <laughs> you know, you're in the nightmare. <laughs> um, yeah. Yeah, that's right. And, you know, if, and again, just not to belabor this too much, but in terms of case versus infection, right? Like we actually are infected with all sorts of microbes of various kinds, but we're not, we're not in any sense cases of any disease, right? Um, so these are important distinctions, but it seems like the group has changed definitions or started to misuse them. And that, and, and the group has then painted reality and, and made inferences of a particular kind, painted reality in a particular way. And it's a disconnect for me and for you and for others as well. And I, I suspect for a lot more, but uh, uh, there's some of those people who are going to conform, right? And then there are some people who are going to stay independent. And, but, but I exactly. think that this, the, you know, the fact that when, when I started to see these ash moments, let's call them. Ash moments. Yes. <laughs> I had these Great. ash moments. Then I notice them all over the place. So it's like once you get a few ash moments, you start to notice them everywhere. And and it's weird because especially with regard to the pandemic, everybody is singing from the same song sheet. So it's not like the air is random, right? Right. Like, it's not like everybody just picks a different line in the ash experiment. Yes. Everybody's picking the, the same 
what I perceive to be the wrong line. <laughs> right. Or it's, let's say, for example, maybe it's always the longer line. The longer line. That's right. Or the shorter, yeah. like it's maybe there's a consistency in the type of error. Yeah. Error that's being seen. And I think that's what, and I know we've discussed this before um, offline, and, you know, that may trigger in some people a conspiratorial worldview, right? Mm -hmm. um, because they'll say, like, why is everybody wrong the same way? Yeah. Why are all my ash moments stacking up the same in, in one direction? And That's you right. see that you see that actually recognized in the ash in the ash study itself. Yeah. So if you if you caught it in the video, something that Ash did was the errors didn't start until the third trial. Yeah. So he doesn't come in right away with the error. So people aren't wrong right away. The other thing that happens is only so many of the trials have incorrect responses. Right. The reason for that is because he didn't want to make people suspicious. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So if the group's wrong right away and the group's wrong and always wrong right away, all the way through the, the, the thought was people in the, in the study are going to get suspicious that something's right. going on here, that yeah. this isn't, this yeah. isn't right. That maybe just maybe there's some kind of conspiracy happening here. And, and, and that, in fact, in, in his case, there was a conspiracy. There actually was, funny right? Thing, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So there was a conspiracy happening in the room. The participant wasn't in on it. That's right, exactly. Yeah. And the experimenter did not want to tip off that there was this conspiracy, right? So it's, you got to convey, you got to convey the conspiracy without the participant catching on <laughs> that there's a conspiracy. Yeah. Now, we're not saying that there is a conspiracy behind this whole pandemic response. We're, we're completely agnostic in this regard, but we're saying uh, that you can imagine why people arrive at a conspiratorial uh, account or try to figure out an, a conspiratorial account, right? Because they're seeing all this systematic error and they're wondering, how, how can that possibly be? Right. right. Something doesn't seem right. So in the context of the study, that study, they wouldn't be called... Let's say if somebody was suspicious, somebody was suspicious and they didn't believe the study, they wouldn't be called the conspiracy theorist. Right. That's They'd right. just be suspicious. Yeah. Yeah. We got to the get, there's is, a whole, yeah. Yeah. Go, go ahead. on. Yeah. We, I think we have to, we have to get into this whole literature on conspiracy theories and, um, the conspiratorial worldview and those sorts of things, because there's a whole area in psychology that deals with these, uh, issues. Um, but yeah. But it's also a good time to potentially talk about the, so when you're in these ash moments, mm -hmm. what it feels like to be in these ash moments. So if we go back to those types of people from the study, right, we get the, the independents, the cell like the, the conformers, and then the people in the middle mm -hmm. and what it actually feels like to be, to be in this situation. So there's, you know, one interpretation is that, you know, when, when people conform, it's kind of like this easy painless automatic thing that just happens or maybe conversely when people are independent that they're you know these stalwart people and they nothing phases them and it's easy and they can just call call it like they see it mm -hmm. um but what at the ash study actually shows because he did quite extensive interviews after the study with participants yeah and he so he had a lot of qualitative data a lot of interview responses and in those responses, you could actually see there's quite a bit of tension in people and there's a real conflict. So this nightmare, it's not just yeah. a catchy, you know, it's not just a catchy phrase. You're creating a situation and it creates a real, creates a, creates a lot of distress. Yeah. So you're trying to reconcile what you're seeing with what everybody's saying. Maybe you're not sure which way to go. And just because you maybe quickly decide which way to go and you go along with the group or you don't go along, along with the group doesn't mean that it's easy or that it's comfortable. Yeah. There's still there's still quite a lot of psychological distress that happens in this um, in this scenario. Yeah, in the uh, in the uh, 1951 paper that was reprinted in 1952, so I think I have the reprint version here. But he identifies three types of these independent subjects, and so the one that you just mentioned would be in his third category, where he says a third group of independent subjects manifest considerable tension and doubt. Mm -hmm. but adhere to their judgments on the basis of a felt necessity to deal adequately with the task, right? So there's, there's this tension and doubt that they're trying to fight through. And then he has these two other categories. So he says, there are some participants who are just confident and they're unshakable. 
right? They are just, this is my answer and that's it and screw the rest of you, right? <laughs> uh, so, so there were those guys out there. And then there were those who were independent and withdrawn, he says. And they just didn't respond emotionally. No spontaneous emotion to the situation. They just behaved independently and, and everything was fine. And then you had these conflict subjects. Um, and so I think it's hard to be the person who has that conflict, that doubt, the uncertainty, right? Because that's, that's uh, psychologically challenging. That's the epistemological nightmare. The other independent folks, like they're not having a, con you know, maybe the, ind the fully independent person, they're not having a conflict, right? They're just like, these guys are a bunch of boneheads. <laughs> uh, they probably, they probably get, their eyes are screwed up. Um, but yeah, so, so there's, and then you get the people who think their eyes are screwed up, that there's yeah. something wrong with, there's, there's quite a few people who said that something's wrong with me. I'm not seeing things right. It must be some yeah. kind of illusion. That's rationalization. Right. Something's, you know, something's not right with me. Yeah. 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 So, so, the group uh, can't be wrong. How could a group be wrong? Yeah, that's right. And, you know, let's, let's just, again, I want to just spend a little bit more time talking about conformity in the context of this, of this pandemic, just to help everybody see how this applies. Cause I think there were a lot of pressures to conform to the majority views of the pandemic. Right. Um, and so, you know, the ethics of the vaccine mandates, for instance, right? There was a lot of pressure to conform to the group and the actual overt mandate that now puts a punishment on not going along is just the most extreme part of that pressure to conform, right? Because there's social ostracization, um, you know, that's, that's going to be in place. Um, there, there's a lot of pressure to continue to believe that the vaccines are as effective as initially advertised, which is like 95 plus percent effective and perfectly safe, right? That was a the message. There's still a lot of pressure to conform to that message. There's mm -hmm. still a lot of pressure, I think, social pressure to conform to the idea that this COVID pandemic is like Ebola, <laughs> you know, like really, really, it's just much worse than maybe it, it actually is. Um, and then I think there's also, I'm, I'm feeling a lot of pressure to conform to the notion that lockdowns really work and they're necessary and they're, they're the only way forward. Right. And, mm -hmm. and all these interventions are the only way forward. And, and like, I would maybe people might also feel some pressure to say that you can't really identify or talk about the negative side effects of lockdowns. Right. So, um, I don't know if you have any other ones that you want to bring up, but those are the ones I hear people bringing up as uh, points where they feel a lot of pressure to conform. Right. Another one is the um, is the use of masks. Okay. Yeah, so that's a really good one. The you know let's say the research behind masks, and then even just logical analysis or putting two and two together with respect to the size of the holes and the size of of viral um, viruses. Um, and the sort of the unanimous, uh, emphasis and uh, on the importance of it in stopping, stopping spread. There's a That's clear, right. you know, there's a clear drumbeat about the importance of those and an analysis of the, you know, of the actual, you know, facts of the matter with respect to the physical ca characteristics of the mask, a lot of the research behind masks themselves. Yeah. Um, and there's, there's, there's a meta, there's sort of a meta consensus as well right and we've talked about it before so this idea that there's that there is a scientific consensus on the efficacy of these policies on the efficacy yes. of lockdowns on the efficacy of right of the vaccines of the efficacy of masks it, it, there's a consensus everybody yeah. agrees the group has decided it's line one every time and if you're going to dissent you're going to be a you know the majority of one or whatever as ash refers to it as and yeah, you're, you're on your own. So come, yeah, with, and come with the group. We obviously feel that as scientists ourselves, right? Because there's uh, the pressure from the scientific community to go along with the consensus. And I find that really weird because, you know, in the normal day-to-day -day working of science, um, dissent is actually encouraged because that's how you make advancements, right? It's always the, the, there's in, in every area there, there becomes a dominant view and then it takes the dissenter to think about things differently, to look at the data differently and come up with a different conclusions, prediction and so on. 
and that changes the field and the field advances. But in these certain situations, it seems like that's just morally not allowed, mm -hmm. um, which, which to me is, uh, seems to be a, a problem, it, actually a violation maybe of the normal responsibility of scientists um, in, in the context, which is always a challenge, right? We're, we're supposed to be skeptics, we're supposed to be challenging received views, mm -hmm. but uh, that seems to be morally unacceptable right now. So I wonder if that's a good time then to talk about, we, I don't think we've talked about it yet, is one, what are some of the things that sort of exacerbate or mitigate conformity? Ah, okay. And one of yeah. those, one of those things is dissenting or having fellow dissenters in the room. So yeah. the violation of this, let's say expectation to conform mm -hmm. and let's say his, let's say conventionally, or let's say every day, as you're talking about this idea of there being conflict is sort of this conformity busting process in order to get to, okay, what line is really the longest or what, what line really matches up? Yeah. We're not doing this just to get along. We want to presumably figure out what's actually what. Yeah, that's right. And so th they had different kinds of dissenters in the ASH studies, right? Do you, do you remember all the different categories there? Yeah. So generally speaking, the presence of a dissenter, so a, a confederate who was not going along with the group, but was going to was going to break away with the group, go along with the correct response in this case, that that quite drastically lowered the tendency for people to conform. Right. So it didn't, it didn't solve the problem. It wasn't a hundred percent, but it reduced the errors, the number of errors. I believe it was 25% reduction in the number of errors. Yeah. Just um, by having a fellow individual. So one other person in the room who didn't go along with the group. Yeah, and I'm just looking at the paper here, and, the, yeah. the 1951-52 paper, um, and he calls these true partners who dissent, and he says, a disturbance of the unanimit unanimity of the majority markedly increased the independence of the critical subjects. Mm -hmm. um, so there, there's that. And then he talks about this situation where you have a true partner who dissents at first, and then starts... Uh, responding with the group. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So what happened, what happens then? Right. So yeah. here, here, so we'll put it in the context of the, of the pandemic, right? Let's say you're, you're questioning the efficacy of, um, let's say lockdowns. Okay. You're saying, okay, the way you see it doesn't maybe more harm than good. You know, talk about maybe the great Barrington declaration say, okay, mm -hmm. that makes, that makes sense. And let's say you have a, a neighbor who's with you. Say, so, yeah, you know what? I, yeah, I agree. It's not, it's line one. I, I, I see it. We see it together. It's line one. Yeah. And then later on that neighbor all of a sudden says, you know what? We got to lock down. Now they're going with the group. Yeah. And what the ash study, what is it? The ash study finds that what, what kind of effect is that going to have on the. Okay. Well, I have a quote here for you. So uh, they say, we found that the experience of having had and then lost a partner uh, restores the majority effect to its full force. So it's like, it's like the center wasn't even there. Yeah. People then start conforming again. So there is, you can imagine that if you want somebody to conform, you want to pull as many dissenters into your group and as you do that, that'll spontaneously make more dissenters come into your group, right? In, in, in line with the majority. Mm -hmm. That's very, very powerful. And then they also had this other case. Uh, the true partner starts out conforming to the majority and then dissents. And uh, this increases independence of the critical subject. So if you want more people dissenting, you got to pull a conformer into the dissenting group and then that's going to make other people be more likely to dissent right mm -hmm. so this you could see this interesting <laughs> group dynamic at play here right every time you get a defector to the other group it strengthens their position mm -hmm. quite a bit but there's no um, depending on the situation there's no hangover necessarily so it doesn't necessarily strengthen the participants resolve in the absence 
of the dissenter when right. they when they're with you at first yeah mm-hmm. so there's kind of this it's a it's a sort of real time dynamic one of the things that ash did as well is in those initial studies where it was the dissenters with you with the participant with the participant and then defects there was another condition he had where the dissenters with the participant and the dissenter defects but because they have to go somewhere else yeah so they have another meeting they got to go to and they leave the room Mm -hmm. and under those conditions there's a little bit there's more of a there's more resistance right that the participant isn't doesn't doesn't start agreeing with the group as as readily um as they would if the participant actually was there and it's more of a betrayal yeah yeah well you know um there's uh since i I brought up the topic of the in-group out-group elements to this um we could bring in the whole intergroup dynamics issue into this uh, topic of conformity and maybe we could just do it very quickly um, there's an interesting paper by Stalin and colleagues, uh, 2013. The title is Peer Influence, uh, Neural Mechanisms Underlying In-Group Conformity. And I think you're going to love this, right? Because what they do, and, and, and listeners would have to go to our prior video on intergroup dynamics, where we talked about the Tashfelt type studies. Well, in this experiment, what they do is they create, they create these minimal groups using the Tashfelt type group assignment technique that we discussed in the in, in the prior episode participants come into the lab uh they view a series of perceptual illusions and you, people might know the old woman young woman illusion and they're assigned to either a foreground or a background perceiver group um and it's really irrespective of their performance so they're just artificially creating these these groups so you have an in group and you have an out group and then you're given an ash type judgment task which involved just uh, estimating the number of dots that were flashed on the screen. And uh, before you give your final judgment, you're given the estimates uh, from a member of your in-group or a member of the out-group. And the, the cool thing that you find is that you have a lot more conformity to the group when it's your in-group than to the out-group. Okay, so there is this huge biasing or there's, there's a greater conformity to uh, your own group, to the in-group. And uh, yeah, they write the following. Their findings suggest that people conform more to in-group members than to out-group members because the behavior of in-group members is more strongly associated with the experience of positive affect and reward. And they're also measuring brain activity. And what they find is that when you're conforming to uh, members of your in-group, um, Participants uh, experience activation in the dopamine reward centers of the brain. Okay, so you're basically getting a reward hit <laughs> in the yeah, brain, hit, like yeah. like as if you were taking drugs or, must or be doing the right something thing. you really you must like. be doing the right thing. Exactly. So you're kind of wired almost mm-hmm. to conform to the in-group. And um, this plays out, in, interestingly, in a number of contexts. And, uh, and one, one of them is... Uh, in, in the context of morality. And uh, I, I think it's worth talking about that for a moment here because one of the key issues in the context of this pandemic um, is uh, or surrounds the ethics of the vaccine mandates and the ethics of the interventions, right? Whether it's moral to sacrifice the rights of the individual for the rights of the group. And uh, conveniently, there, there's, a, there's a study that I found <laughs> that addresses this. <laughs> Um, Kundu and Cummins, 2012, morality and conformity, the ash paradigm applied to moral decisions. So it's like they're using the ash um, methodology, but looking at morality. Create the epistemological nightmare, but for moral situations. Yes, exactly. And uh, the moral judgments that they had participants may make involved ethical dilemmas, and they've been used in other Um, studies in the literature and the ethical dilemmas essentially paint a scenario where you have to sacrifice one person who is not at all at risk to save a group of people who are facing some sort of an imminent threat okay so uh, an example of an ethical dilemma that they use would be what's called the trolley problem the trolley problem and uh, for our listeners i just want to read you guys the trolley problem so that you, you get a sense of what's what's going on here so here it is a runaway trolley 
is approaching a fork in the tracks. On the left track are five people. On the right track is one person. If you do nothing, the trolley will go left, causing the deaths of five people. The only way to avoid this is to push a switch that will cause the trolley to go right, causing the death of the single person. Is it morally permissible to push the switch under these circumstances? So is it morally permissible to push the switch, kill the one person to save the majority? And it turns out that roughly 80 to 85% of the participants would say yes in this circumstance. And they would say, yes, it's morally permissible. And so we can call this like a morally permissible scenario. Like most people would say, the group would say, this is morally per permissible. Okay, let me just tell you one more other quick dilemma here. Um, this is called the sacrifice scenario, okay? So you, your spouse, and your four children are crossing a mountain range on your return journey to your homeland. You have inadvertently set up camp on a local clan's sacred burial ground. The leader of the clan says, if you kill your oldest son with the clan leader's sword, he will let the rest of you live. Is it morally permissible to kill your oldest son under the circumstances? Okay. So that, that's another type of dilemma. And here in one university sample, only 28% of the students said yes. And in, in another sample, I think it was something like 51% said yes. So this one was kind of like people agree this is impermissible to do this. Same kind of idea. You sacrifice one for the group. In the first Charlie problem, very permissible. In this case, impermissible. Okay. So people are presented with these and they have to make judgments. Is it permissible or impermissible um, to sacrifice the one person? And they had two critical conditions. So in one case, you're, do, you're doing these judgments alone, okay, with the experimenter. So that's a control condition. In the other case, you're in an ash type situation where you have three confederates and they make their judgments before you arrive at your judgments. And, and here in these judgments, it, it wasn't just a binary yes or no. They had a range and a scale. So one highly permissible, seven uh, highly, sorry, one highly impermissible, seven highly permissible. Okay. And here's a key part. Just like in the ASH studies, the group would sometimes go against what the usual norms are. Okay. So... The Confederates would judge the permissible vignettes as impermissible and the impermissible vignettes as permissible. Okay. And okay, here's what they found. I'm quoting here. Vignettes that are typically judged permissible were found to be significantly less so under dissenting social pressure than when participants made decisions on their own. And they go on. Conversely, vignettes that are normally judged highly impermissible were rated as more permissible when confederates said so than when participants made decisions by themselves these results they go on to say uh, a bit further down these results clearly show that our participants judgments were strongly swayed by social context even for vignettes that typically elicit the opposite decision from an overwhelming majority of decision makers so people would sway their moral judgments to conform to the crowd. And it's interesting because they would, if you look at the measures, they would make things that were permissible, less permissible, and the things that were impermissible, way more permissible, right? And they also, just one more quick fact, uh, Jeff, and I'll get your feedback on this. So they also had what, what they called morally ambiguous scenarios. And these would be ones where in pre-tests and other studies, you get a lot more variability in terms of people's responses, right? So um, it, there wasn't a lot of agreement. So they, they said these are kind of morally ambiguous. And it turns out that it's on those ones where people really shifted and changed their, their perspective, they would be much more likely to go with the group. So under moral uncertainty, you're much more likely to go with the crowd. And I'm thinking, you know, this... This, uh, I think, is very relevant for the current pandemic scenario, particularly with regard to the mo morality of the vaccine mandates, which effectively violate a single person's bodily autonomy, right? And it's justified because it said that it's, it's, it's for the greater good. It, it's for the majority. And 
Uh, you notice here how people will change their view on this, could change their view on this specific issue based on these findings. Um, uh, th they could change their view based on the view of the majority. So if the majority all of a sudden says, oh, bodily autonomy, what's that? <laughs> you know, not in this case, right? People who haven't thought about this very much, maybe, um, and who previously might have said, no, that's not, it's never acceptable to violate somebody's bodily autonomy. Come on. They're now maybe more likely to go along with the group. What do you think? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's really interesting. All those examples, what you see is, like we've been talking about the ASH study and we're talking about lines and visual perceptions. But what you see with these studies is this mechanism of conformity, this process of conformity is applicable to any number of domains, even yeah. morality. And even when you're talking about life, life and it's scenario based, what have you, but it's life and death situations. Yeah. So what are people going to use to figure out what's right or what's wrong? Yeah. Well, what's What's everybody else? What does everybody else think, think is what, what's, what do they say? <laughs> That's right. Um, and and th there's research that actually shows that you derive your moral stances, especially when you haven't thought about it before, from your in-group. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So you see the interconnection between all the different levers of manipulation, right? So the in-group, out-group, potentially even some obedience. Then you're also seeing the leveraging of, you know, conformity. And with the application or the extension of it to, let's say, moral domains, we can really see like a layering of conformity happening you know, at multiple at multiple levels. So at the level of perception, so day-to-day -day perception, looking at data, you'll see, let's say that'd be like the, the ash, you know, looking at the lines, looking at the looking at the data. Well, what does the group say? The data says, okay, I'll go with the I'll go with the group on that. Is that but is that right or wrong? Is that is that morally acceptable? Do we do that? Let me let me check with the group on that. And then the group comes back, yeah, this is what we do. So you're getting that check that conformity possibility at any number, let's say of layers from perceptual to higher order conceptual ethical issues with respect to, let's say human rights. So what, what, what do we, what do we think about human rights now? Okay. Let's check. We're going to check with the, we're going to check with the group and see what, what's okay. And you almost, you could see that happening with, with a lot of the response, right? You may, you may have noticed, like, I know I've seen, especially of late, there's a lot of polls being published. And a lot of data being published saying, like, what do people think about this? What do people think about the, uh, if it's right or wrong, what do people think about if it's right or wrong to arrest people who yeah. haven't been vaccinated, for example? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Oh, 70% of people say that's okay. And that's a, that would be like a, you know, a news story. Yeah. And that's, that's conveying to the so public what the group believes. What's that doing? Exactly. This is what we think now. This is what we think. What, what you may have had ideas around right or wrong about, about some of those things, but now you're getting, you're getting that consensus building information. You're getting that, that, that conformity inducing information mm -hmm. on some of these things. And it's coming across on the, as you met, as, as that study uh, articulates in these ethical situations, right? In these ethical questions. Yeah. Not just this graph says it's a 70 30 split. What does that mean? It's in these conceptual, ethical, abstract, you know, tricky, complex situations. And it's yeah. in fact, like you said, maybe even more likely people are going to conform in that situation when it is ambiguous. Yes. So the, the lever of control, possible control there is even potentially stronger, right? Mm -hmm. You know, I, I want to pick up on something that you said that you're seeing the interaction of, of these various dynamics and principles that we've been talking about. So conf, uh, in-group, out-group dynamics, conformity, and we can also overlay the issue of authority, right? Because mm -hmm. you can also have authority structures give you the consensus, right? Consensus yes. view and the group view. Um, and so that now comes into play into the whole, into the whole mix. And actually, I have a, I have a clip here. If you didn't, if you want to entertain it here for a second, sure. uh, Jeff. But before I, before you do that, I just want to mention something before I forget. Yeah. <laughs> with the in group, with the in group, out group, where you're mentioning about people conform more to their more to their in group. Even in the ash, the ash studies, when when we go back to the dissenter, the presence of a dissenter, that participants, when there was a dissenter, they had feelings of of warmth towards the dissenter. Yeah. So there is this. Or, or going back to the uh, the idea of you know that there's these chemicals 
that can be released with respect to groups. So what you could potentially see there even is with the dissenter, the start, the beginning of the creation of a, of a group. Yes. You can maybe see that sort of ground up process of, of some of these, let's say neurochemical and psychological processes working together. Oh, that's a very good point. We're in this together. Um, and then we're going to maybe, there may be the creation of a, like I said, creation of a group there. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. That, the idea a, that, a clip. Yeah. I have a clip, but the idea that, uh, um, that the conformity scenario could then lead to the formation of the groups, which then uh, continues group dynamics. I mean, th this is all so interesting how it's all intertwined. Okay. Here's my clip. It's important to underline that close to 90% of truckers in this country are vaccinated, like close to 90% of Canadians. Okay, let me just pause it for a second and just make the point that this is with regard to this huge trucker convoy that's moving across Canada. And actually, I think it's now caught on to other places as well. But we're talking about a, a, <laughs> a truckload of truckers <laughs> moving across. <laughs> How long was this convoy? Do you, do you remember the number? It was like... I'm hearing different reports. I don't know. I've heard you know 70, 70 kilometers. kilometers i've heard yeah. 40 kilometers it's, yeah. yeah i don't know yeah but that's a lot it's a, it's a lot of people right so obviously it's a truck it's, of trucks. Yeah. <laughs> yeah and it it's made it's obviously you know come to the popular uh interest of people and so you have justin trudeau having to address that right so here he is addressing this issue over the past many months and years now canadians have stepped up to protect each other, to protect our frontline workers, to protect our elders, to protect our young people, to protect people like truckers who are putting food on our grocery store shelves. Canadians have stepped up to do the right thing to protect the freedoms and the rights of Canadians to get back to the things we love to do. We know the way through this pandemic is by getting everyone vaccinated. And the overwhelming majority, close to 90% of Canadians have done exactly that. The small fringe minority of people who are on their way to Ottawa or who are uh, holding unacceptable uh, views uh, that they're expressing do not represent the views of Canadians who have been there for each other, who know that following the science and stepping up to protect each other is the best way to continue to ensure our freedoms, our rights, our values as a country. Okay. I, I love that clip because it, I think, illustrates not only just the issue of conformity, but all maybe the, the, the key principles we've been talking about uh, since the first ep since the inception of this show. What, oh, yeah. what are your thoughts on this? Yeah, I love you see the emphasis on the numbers. Yeah. Right? The the group the groups. You have yeah, the groups, right? But then the group sizes, so small, fringe, overwhelming yeah. majority. Yeah, so you have the in-group out-group dynamic and and then, and then on then top of that you the conformity. Yeah. You have the size. Yeah. It's everybody's doing this. Everybody thinks this. Exactly. We think this. Everybody's doing it. We're in this together. They, yeah, that's right. <laughs> that small, that small they, right? Notice really though, see? yeah, you notice that he's, uh, he is identifying the groups in terms of vaxxed and unvaxxed, right? Uh, mm -hmm. So he's, he's being very clever here because he can make the case that 90 something percent of the people are are vaccinated so he makes the group of vaccinated people seem very large the, the majority and then yeah. you have this mi minority of unvaxxed people um and so that's how he creates both the in-group out-group dynamic and also this issue of conformity right mm -hmm. but what's what people might be missing is that this is not about vaxxed and unvaxxed at all it's about coercive vaxxing versus non-coercive vaxxing right and so there are a lot of people actually in probably taking part in these uh, in, in in these convoys and the uh, the resistance, so to speak, who are vaccinated but just disagree with 
these, these vaccine mandates. So he's being very clever in the way he mm-hmm. frames the problem. And I think we want our listeners and our viewers to start to notice these things, right? Not just yes. in you know, Trudeau and other people, but everywhere. You, you can yeah. learn about these dynamics all over the place. Yeah. And like the, the language is so, to me, the language is so clear. And it's a perfect clip to show for this, for this topic. It ties in the in-group, the out-group. But that numbers game that's being articulated Mm -hmm. right so you can't say that it's zero he would if he could right yeah that's right but he can't because it's it's there that's the reason he's talking about it because it's there it's not zero so the closer it is to zero the better right right so now you okay so here's the other ash so so minority of minorities right yeah so here's the other ash moment okay so now that's what he says, 95% and all this kind of stuff, right? There's this huge majority. Then you look at this trucker convoy and you say like, this is not a small fringe minority, right? Mm-hmm. It's, <laughs> it's actually, there's a lot of people taking part and they're not just of one kind, right? Yep. Like all the different demographics are represented there. People pulling up in their Mercedes to hold up their signs, people pulling up in their trucks. They got tattoos and no tattoos and they're all sorts of different colors and ages and everything. Like you, this is Canada coming out, Yeah, <laughs> yeah. but it's going to be painted as a small fringe minority. Probably that's, you know, racist and stuff. And, and notice <laughs> what he says too, right? Is that they hold unacceptable views. Mm-hmm. So their judgment mm-hmm. of the line is incorrect. Our judgment of the line length is correct. The majority's judgment is correct. Well, he didn't say correct. <laughs> he, he said, said unacceptable. unacceptable. Yes, unacceptable. Yeah, ab- absolutely right. I'm, I'm, in, I'm inferring there. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah, but there's so much, there's so much there to unpack too, right? With respect to the, the convoy and, you know, some things that may be worth pointing out Um, at this point is I think one of the things there's a bit of to put it, we're going to put some psychological grammar on this. There's a bit of a battle going on, right? Where, so that's, so Justin made a move, right? He made a play for, let's say he's leveraging the in-group, out-group. He's leveraging the numbers, right? So he's, he's making a, um, in-group, out-group conformity play mm-hmm. appeal to people. But then what you see with a convo- convoy, like you pointed out, is you're seeing a very clear counter to that, to that play that basically nullifies what he's saying. So what you're seeing is you're seeing big numbers, right? You're seeing mm-hmm. quite a diverse group. Mm-hmm. The other thing you're seeing is the geography, so you're seeing it's across Canada. Yeah, it's you're right. East, west, south. So it's ca- it's Canada. It's all of Canada. It's not mm-hmm. fringe. Even if it was a small number from across Canada, it's still coming from across Canada. Yeah. So that's a hard that's a hard sell in the face of that information, right? The other thing you're seeing too is the it's very patriotic looking. Mm-hmm. So a lot of flags. Yep. Freedom. Yep. So it's very patriotic. It looks very Canadian. Yep. People are out, are, <laughs> people are out in the cold. <laughs> people are out in the cold in the snow, standing outside all day. Yeah. Does that look pretty Canadian? What looks more Canadian, standing out in the cold or in the snow or being inside on Zoom? Yeah, that's right. It looks, yeah, so I- it looks, it's very Canadian looking. It's very patriotic looking. It doesn't have this small fringe look to it. So there's all these counters against this conformity in group, out group play. So is it they, they, they being the ones that aren't Canadian when clearly it looks very, very Canadian and it's coming from, you know, across, across Canada. And like you said, it's getting support from not just, not just people in that occupation. Mm -hmm. So let's say even if you, you go with this 90 or 90 R 10 aren't, it's a small 10, that small 10%. It's not that small 10%. It's coming from, so you're seeing very, cl- so the convoy, what you're seeing is very clear counters to that messaging. Right. That's trying to leverage, let's say, this conformity dynamic. Yeah. So yeah. it's not, it's not, and it's not sticking. It's almost people are, it, 
like you it's almost laughable right like it's it seems like a punchline when you see move counter it doesn't it doesn't it's not holding up yeah like so what you could start to see mm -hmm. sorry go ahead no you 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 go go ahead (laughs) <laughs> so here's a here's a prediction here's a prediction can we have predictions on the podcast absolutely because we're scientists <laughs> yes <laughs> hypo- I'll, I'll make a hypothesis <laughs> hypothesis manipulation check hypothesis manipulation check convoy hypothesis is look for wait for new um new manipulations new new moves right. new messaging Right. So a move off of, so you're seeing the move, you're seeing the leveraging of conformity in group, out group that gets nullified by the convoy. So now you're going to see new manipulations, new messaging, new techniques to try and deal with that. So watch for a new and different strategies, yeah, techniques, that's, messaging. That's very um, interesting. And I think you're seeing that I'll, 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 I'll reverse it hot off the, as of, I think it was this morning, I can't remember when I came across, but uh, the opposition leader coming out with a statement or video um, supporting the convoy. Ah, okay. So I think you're already starting to see some adjustment to right. how things get handled. So we'll mm-hmm. see what, we'll see what happens. Keep your eyes open for <laughs> Yeah. For so, new, it, so the, it's a pretty vague hypothesis. The hypothesis we're going to see different <laughs> different techniques, different different messaging that's going to move away from the in-group, out-group, and it's going to move away from the conformity. So watch for things that don't emphasize the size, don't em- emphasize the us and them. It's going to be maybe something else. What yeah, or some distraction altogether from this whole thing because what, what you don't want to do, if you're playing the conformity t- uh, you know, uh, play at this point, you don't want dissenters. And and so the, the other dynamic, as I think you pointed out, is that the more people that show up to this, the, the, the more the dissenters are piling up. The group yeah. of dissenters is now growing, right? Yeah. And that's that's not good if you want to conform to, you know, uh, Trudeau's messaging here. So... Conformity they, doesn't work when there's dissenters. Exactly. That it way, work. It doesn't work. Yeah, yeah. As, as we mentioned, yeah. And so... You, you, you could expect that if I, if I was Trudeau, what I would try to do is deflect attention away from the convoy, right. right? Because you don't want the public to be thinking about the fact that there are all these dissenters because then they're going to start thinking, well, maybe there is a Contain. different reality. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, that's right. So, Contain so you can the see dissenters. that. Yeah. yeah, how, yeah. how the, 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 the convoy itself is interesting because on the one hand, it gives you there, you can think of it from the Ash perspective of, as that's the line on the left, right? And then Trudeau is saying, no, 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 that's, that's, there's, it's just a minority, right? So mm-hmm. you're not seeing this correctly. You gotta, you gotta say this is just a minority, right? So they are mm-hmm. essentially an, an, an instance of reality, right? That mm-hmm. the prevailing view, the group is trying to, uh, paint in a different light, cast as a minority, right? As a very mm-hmm. small fringe minority. But also, they are the dissenters. So now they play another role in the whole Ash scenario. The more people that get, get out there are, the more dissenters there are, and you're growing the group of dissenters, and you so you're undermining the whole concept of con- conformity to the um, accepted dominant view. Mm-hmm. Well, that's interesting. I think I, if I'm picking up one of the things you're saying is, is... Is there an ash, there's an ash moment. Are we, so we can go back to an ash moment with the articulate, with the description of the convoy. So he's saying, yes, so the, that's right. the convoy is large and he's saying it's not large. We all, that's so right. maybe what you'll see then is a doubling down is everybody says it's not large. Uh, yes, that's right. That would be one example. That's right. But so, so the convoy actually is, you can look at, it serves multiple roles in it, yes. in the whole ash scenario if you were to look at it from an yeah. ash lens you would look at it several different ways layers of ash yeah layer, <laughs> layer it's ashes all around <laughs> let's hope it doesn't end in ashes that's not yeah that's not hopefully that's not some kind of yeah hopefully that's not a prediction <laughs> that's right <laughs> yeah okay all right so where do you want to go from here so from here that's a good question um one of the things we could talk about, um, I got a few things we could talk about. 
One is we haven't talked about it yet. It feels like we're going a bit backwards, but it still could be important because I think it's a topic that comes up and might be some things people are thinking of is when we think about the ash findings, right? Is we see these types, the Mm -hmm. independents, the conformists and the people in the middle. So what is it about these people that make them maybe more susceptible to the different categories, let's say. I don't want to use the term, yeah. I'm trying to use the term categories, but say types okay. or classifications, right? Yeah. So is there something we can predict? Is there something predictable about who can, who's, who's going who's gonna to resist, who's going to conform? And there is some research on that. There's actually not that much to be, to be, um, to be honest that I could find. Mm. I thought it was going to be a more um, popular topic. More it seems developed, like, yeah. Yeah, it's because it seems like one where it could speak to this is this is this is just me theorizing, right? It could speak to the interpretation of the ash data as being like kind of kind of more uh, stronger evidence that there's conformity, and then that being the interpretation. So there's not much, let's say, on the surface to look for with respect to okay, well, if everybody conforms, what's there to look for with respect yeah. to who doesn't conform? There's no room for individual differences, right? It's just a human tendency. We all we all kind of do it, and it's perfectly natural and understandable, and maybe in some cases logical and desirable. Mm-hmm. Is is in some ways, you know, maybe some of the some of the way this stuff gets presented in in the in the literature. But what you see in the in the research is there's very clear distinctions, right? Or there's definitely there's definitely distinctions that can be made. So some people have looked at this question, but like I said, not that not that many as, as many as I thought. So it's possible I'm missing something. So there could be some a line yep. of literature out there that I'm not I couldn't I couldn't find. But I did I did a little bit of digging, and a lot of the stuff is kind of older, not not so much contemporary stuff. But one thing I cross referenced a bit is the older stuff tends to get cited in newer in newer reviews and stuff. So it doesn't seem like there's necessarily much contemporary interest in this kind of question. But mm. what did come out, one of the things that people looked at um, specifically, perhaps not surprising given our current, you know, situation is, let me just pull up the actual um, correlations here. So what you see is in a few studies, a correlation between conformity and authoritarianism. Ooh. So in which direction do we think that go? that might go in? I think so, that you conform more if you're in an authoritarian mindset. Yeah. So higher conformity <laughs> is associated with higher authoritarianism. And they're not trivial correlations that have been reported. So 0. 0.4, 0. 0.39, 0. 0.44. So pretty, pretty sizable uh, correlations that have been reported. Interestingly oh. as well, um, in a replication of Milgram, um, authoritarianism was also related to obedience. So if you're more th- authoritarian, you're going to conform more, you're going to comply with um, authority more, you're going to be more obedient obedient as well. And there's a few there's a few studies that have looked at this authoritarian conformity relation. Um, By the way, so just very, see that. Just very quickly, just to interject, um, people I think typically think about authoritarianism is something that's a property of those who are politically on the right. Okay. Um, but there's some recent work showing that actually there's authoritarianism across the whole spectrum. So mm-hmm. you could be actually very left leaning and be very authoritarian. Right. right? And, and that so, probably comes out a lot of that literature about, you know, right wing authoritarianism. Exactly. That's right. A, that's right. Yeah, which, which, by the way, again, shows you there are these biases in the literature, right? Um, just like you said, there's a, this, this bias to paint ash as though, uh, in, in terms of supporting the notion that everybody conforms or a lot of people conform, there are these other kinds of biases that push people to be thinking about, um, you know, authoritarianism as something as on the, on a politically, on a, as occupying a particular pole on political dimensions, right, on right. the right. Yeah, so, something that's applicable to only a certain Yeah, but it's across the board. So it's very interesting. Yeah. So you can have a lot of left-leaning people now being very authoritarian in the sense that they believe that our government should be very uh, uh, directive, right? And controlling mm-hmm. with regard to how to, how to address this pandemic. Yeah. So some other, um, other individual differences that have been found to correlate with the tendency to conform. Um, now... 
this is this is from 1955 um so it's really it's really contemporary to ash but here's some here's some correlations so intellectual competence superior mental functioning ego strength leadership ability tolerance social participation and responsibility so you get all these different constructs right so intellectual competence this might be too much to present at once but I'm trying to I'm trying to synthesize, but I might be doing it a disservice. So intellectual competence, superior mental functioning, ego strength, leadership ability, tolerance, social participation, responsibility, were all negatively correlated with conformity. Wow. So if you're higher on all those things I listed, you're gonna be less likely to conform. That's really interesting because you know some of those people who are very conforming would probably uh, think that some of those traits that are associated with not conforming are actually very positive traits. <laughs> right. Yes. That might be an interpretation one could have. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Tolerance, social participation, responsibility. So that, that yeah. cuts counter to a lot of the messaging we're seeing about who's doing, who's doing, who's being responsible, who's doing the right thing, who's who's being, you know, a good citizen, let's say. Indeed. Indeed. Some additional some additional factors um are so this is this is coming from 1963, so um people with a high need for conformity had a higher fear of criticism by others, which mm-hmm. in the context of Ash you can very much understand, uh be more socially anxious. Uh, they defer to authority and they're more situationally uh, focused also have a higher need for structure and there is some literature it sounds like it looks like the effect size is pretty small but there is some evidence to suggest that females more than males are more likely to conform although although it sounds like it's a pretty looks like it's a pretty small effect size so there is some some research that points to um, some uh, systematic variability with respect to individuals that may suggest a tendency to either conform or not to conform. And like I said, this it's not a popular topic, so there could be something I'm missing. But generally, this is the this, these are the findings that have, that I've tended to tended to see, and these are the findings that tend to get cited um, when it gets talked about in more of a contemporary more contemporary research. So, and they're not trivial size magnitude correlations when you when you look at the sizes. So ranging from 0.3 to 0.63. Mm-hmm. And like mm-hmm. I said, with the authoritarianism, it's, you know, basically 0.4. So there's so some... what you're saying is, 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 is that there is a ten that people will have sort of some inbuilt characteristics that will predetermine or, or influence the, whether or not they may conform in a given situation. Yeah. So it seems, yeah, it seems like there's some, there's something predictable. Uh, I'll be in, you know, not the whole story, mm-hmm. but there is, maybe some things that you can point to or identify. Um, the one that keeps t- kept coming up the most, I would say was authoritarianism. Okay. So the going along, right. Going yeah. along with, which, which fits some other things that we, we talked about a little bit. I don't, I don't think we mentioned it explicitly is, um, the group size itself. Oh, uh, yes. how that, how that can affect, um, tendencies to conform. Yeah. So, what was actually kind of surprising, this is quite surprising to me, is there's very clear diminishing returns with respect to group size. So basically what you see in the ASH research specifically is once the group size hits three, so the people who are saying it's line whatever reaches three, it basically tapers off. So the difference between a group size of three versus a group size of 10 mm-hmm. with respect to how much people are, how likely people are going to be to conform, you're not seeing much of a difference. Mm-hmm. So when the, when the critical mass of the group gets to three, you're not seeing any, so you add, you add a fourth, you add a fifth, you know, you collect some more people <laughs> into the, uh, into the group. You're not seeing much of a payoff. Yeah. Which do you think that undermines the application of, uh, Ash to the pandemic situation? Because we're talking about much bigger numbers, obviously, than I don't think so. Numbers. Cause I think it. I would see it going the other way where it, it mm. more so I think sets a lower bar for when some of these uh, mechanisms can kick in. Right. So we don't need, you don't need this population level agreement per se. Right. Just, maybe it's just in your immediate circle. 
Yeah. Every, yeah. Everybody thinks this. It's three people. Everybody thinks this. I'm going to go along along with this. You may not need this this big push. This yeah, big push and and it. especially if you think about the talking heads and the leaders in the media, right? So all you need is the prime minister to say it, the health minister to say it, maybe the opposition leader to agree, and that's you're past three now, <laughs> you know, and then your premier to say it, and then yeah. all of a sudden you've you already now have consensus of a group and or even, now you have to conform even there you may make the case that even if just one of them says it if they're speaking on behalf of a larger group that's enough yeah or if it's three people in your in your in your social circle that say it right mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. but what it does speak to mm -hmm. and it's something you mentioned earlier is sort of the power of dissenters and you see an asymmetry yes that's right so you see if you add five to the conforming group versus adding one to the dissenter group. That five isn't going to have any impact past three, right? Right, right. So, so, but if you just single, add one, yeah. 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 So it's asymmetrical that way. You know, a yes. single addition of a dissenter can have a lot more impact than a single addition of a person in the, in the yeah. uh, larger group. Yeah. So, uh, Jeff, I want to get to solutions here because I'm looking at our time here and, and uh, we're getting long here. I want to get to solutions, but before we do that, what are some things that we should be watching out for in terms of uh, uh, moments that might reveal themselves as situations in which conformity is playing a role? Ooh. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And, 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 and we can think also about maybe factors that are driving conformity during this COVID situation. Right. Um, so I think you, you, the clip you showed is a good example of, of, of what could happen. So mm -hmm. in the messaging, okay. so a lot of people think this, we think this right. large, overwhelming majorities, small minorities, fringe things that really play to play to the numbers. Yeah. Another and and thing, th sorry, that, yeah, that that's ahead. a very no. interesting one, right? This idea that everyone thinks this and so on. People should realize that's actually could be construed as a fallacy in thinking, right? I think uh, uh, there's a word for that. A it's, name it's for that, yeah. Yeah, bandwagon fallacies is one name, but argumentum ad populum, I think, is the, is the technical name for this. And it's basically the idea that the view of the majority must reflect the truth, right? That, that if the majority believe it, it must be true. And so... When when people are trying to make this appeal to the majority, you have to realize that that could actually be a false argument if they're trying to convey that, therefore, it means that their position mm -hmm. is, is, is the right position. And in fact, there's reason to believe that groups cannot get things wrong. We like we know these principles like groupthink and so on, right? Wait, so, <laughs> wait, wait, groups can be... <laughs> yeah. So, and maybe there are even uh, at, at a greater risk of being wrong, maybe than uh in in some cases right so you really want to think about these appeals to the the group group think <laughs> that reminds me too that actually reminds me of so we got we, we always got to talk about milgram so it reminds me too of you know the appeal to authority as yeah. a as a fallacy right so that's right connections to milgram well the the authority said so so it must be you know must be right yeah. Okay. So what are some others here? So watch out for things like everyone thinks what else? Everyone thinks a lot of people, I think the, I think I mentioned it earlier too. So the, the use of poll data. Yes. So this polling of people to figure out what people think about things. Yep. Um, with not, with very little to no, um, attention given to the quality of the poll or yep. how questions were asked. Um, but the conveying of the messaging of numbers, People think this large, large percentages of people think that. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that could be leveraged very easily. I think it has been, and it continues to be leveraged with these polls. Yes. Like, so be, be mindful, be mindful of that. The other one too, is we've talked about before this idea of consensus. Mm. Everybody agrees. We can now move on. Cause we, we figured that out. Everybody agrees. We have scientific consensus. The experts agree. Everybody agrees. If you mm -hmm. disagree, you're on your own. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Those would be some examples that I think to to watch out for to be mindful. Yeah. So of. and 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 those are all kind of related to this argumentum ad populum notion, right? That um, somehow the wisdom of the crowd must be correct. 
Yeah. yeah. Um, or just a simple leveraging of conformity. Like yeah. it's just, it's not even at a level of argument anymore. It's just, this is what it is. This is what yeah. we think. This is right. Everything else, anything else would be, would be a deviation. Hence would be wrong. Yeah. So it's line one. Everybody agrees. Let's mm -hmm. move on. Yeah. So I, I think here I have some thoughts about other factors that might be driving conformity uh, during, during this COVID scenario. And one of them is that some of these interventions, let's for instance, uh, consider the vaccine mandates. I think they actually are selecting people for conformity. So if you think about, if you just remove the dissenters from society, they're like, they just take them out of the room, right? They're no longer in the right. room anymore. You'll see that there's a lot more, there's a lot more agreement, a lot more conformity. Mm -hmm. I almost spilled my water here, <laughs> right? <laughs> flailing my arms around all over the place. So manufactured, so, manufactured consensus, manufactured consensus. And, and particularly by removing dissenters yeah. <laughs> from by society. The elimination of, yeah. Yeah. So that's yeah. something to keep an eye out for. Um, See that I shows think, too, like that to bring it back to in group, out group, you, like the connection there between if you can cleave, cleave off. Yes. The dissenters remove them. Now we have, we have consensus. Now yep. we have full agreement. That's right. Yeah. So, and, and a softer way to do that. And maybe, by we, it's, we, it's this group. Yes. They, they don't count. Cause that's right. They're the minority. They disagree few, they and they're in another group. Okay. Yeah, yeah. that's right. Um, censorship. So th this is, it's, it's, it's another way of effectively removing dissenters, right? And it, it increases the apparent unanimity, unanimity <laughs> of, of the group, right? Um, and so I think we're seeing that a lot. So there are a lot of experts in the scientific community. You can think of, you know, the folks at like Jay Bhattacharya and, and Cool Dorf and, and many, many others around the world who are epidemiologists, who are dissenting from, from uh, the mainstream views on this. Well, they're just completely censored, right? Mm -hmm. They're not allowed to have a voice. And that basically means that you, people can't see the dissenter. So that might drive more conformity. Um, yeah, th this, this notion that you've mentioned already placing people into an out group, which will diminish their influence, right? Because you, when you're looking at making moral, uh, judgments, you're going to look at just your in group, right? So if you can just, uh, put them in the out group, you're already now removing their impact. Yeah. Um, the other one I think would be, uh, attempts to paint reality as being more certain than it is. And conforming with the dominant view, right? So uh, somebody might say something like, or initially it was said of the vaccines, for instance, very early on, even though there wasn't very much known about them yet, these are highly effective and they're, they're very safe, right? So you have these very strong claims about reality. It's like a very confident way of saying this line is of this length, right? Mm. And I wonder if there's any research that may actually look at the confidence well that'd be an interesting study if it hasn't been done looking at the confidence of the confederates right the comments mm -hmm. they they convey to the participant and whether that's going to sway the participants choice but i think I, I keep always looking out for that like when people are making these assertions so confidently that i don't see as being grounded in reality then i know oh there's a manipulation i i need to do a manipulation check <laughs> right. Check that. Yeah. That's really interesting because I think that was built in to Ash. So, so one of the things that's great about going back to the original Ash research is he had so much data and he cut it so many different ways and he looked at so many different things. But one of the things I don't think he looked at was, but I think he had it built into his study was, and I shot in the video, how quick people were at yes. saying what line it was. Ah, so they, right. there, there wasn't a lot of like, we're, we're one of the, one of the conformance or Confederates was pausing, thinking, oh, change his mind. Yeah. You know, there wasn't yeah. any gray. Yeah. So it came across as they were very confident. That yeah. That's that might have been a little bit answer. by the video editing, but, <laughs> but yeah. I think it was, it was like that nevertheless. <laughs> nevertheless. Yeah. And there's even, because, he even has some interesting analysis of the role of the experimenter being in the room. Yes. Yes. And how that helps the justification of the incorrect responses. And I think it feeds into some of these like confidence dynamics. He doesn't explicitly talk about in terms of confidence. So I think that's really interesting. That'd be a great, that'd be a great study.
Yeah, and, and by the way, since you mentioned it, there is, I think, a study looking at whether or not some of the conformity effect is an effect of authority because right. the because the experimenters in the room. And uh, so that would be an interesting one to follow up on. And, and, and I think they conclude, if I'm just vaguely remembering, that they conclude there might be a little bit of an effect of authority, but a lot of it is just the peer pressure um, mm -hmm. that's, uh, that's going on. Okay, I have a final one here. Final factor that's, that's driving conformity or and, and maybe is is an, some evidence of conformity going on and that is um, the use of symbols for conformity and uh, I think these are would be like outward actions <clears throat> that signal what the group believes and so you can imagine that uh, things like masking or vax passing um, fastidiously distancing <laughs> right mm -hmm. These would all be these outward signs that are then used to communicate that you're with the group. <clears throat> right. And uh, it, it communicates the, <clears throat> so let's say in the ash study, what, what happened was it's the declaration of the line, yes, right? It's a declaration. That's right. So if you have a certain attitude, certain perception in order to articulate that, to present that to the world, some visual symbol to represent that is is necessary right yeah that's right that's right that's a great that's a very interesting idea and it really yeah. shows points of the importance if you want to lever some of these conformity mechanisms the importance of having those demonstrations having those visuals to confirm yes. to to present yes yeah so so for instance and and you can th think about how this plays out so forcing people to mask in a particular scenario makes it looks look like there's a lot more consensus yeah. in that scenario. It's, it's basically making everybody say one. That's right. One. That's right. It's yeah. like you get your instruction as you go in the door. When you see this line, everybody respond A or yeah. C. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. yeah no, it's yeah. A very, very powerful. If you th once you start to think about the current context from uh, like these, these foundational experiments the social so psychology are so fundamental and powerful yeah. right to help you yeah. understand this so okay. then even to put that in the context right so the full full context if that's the it's that's like sort of a representation or we could take ash and apply it to that then you start seeing dissenters mm. what's the effect of that 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 that's going to have so you see all these people saying one you see all these people with their visual their visual let's say manifestation of their underlying attitude but then you start seeing hey Somebody else doesn't think it's one. Yeah. Maybe I'm not going to say it's one. And yeah. that becomes a problem. Yeah. Because then if that person says it's not one, now somebody else might not think it's one, then they might say it too. And then yes. it, you get That's the right. asymmetry. And so the way that you could effectively counteract then this kind of pressure is for people to be very steadfast and say, well, no, I'm not going to submit in this case. Mm -hmm. And the more people that you see, for instance, of violating some rule, that pandemic rule or whatever, the more likely then you, you're building the perception of of more dissenters. Yeah. You know? Okay. <clears throat> so let's let's uh, just get to some solutions here, Jeff. Yeah, that's a good segue to solutions. Okay. So uh, start us off here. What are some solutions then to to sort of counteract conformity pressures during the time of this pandemic or any time for that matter? So I would say the big one that we've seen, we've talked, we just, we're just talking about it. <clears throat> Empirically based have presence of dissenters. Yes. So, and it used, we, it was even mentioned, we even talked about with Milgram. So the presence of dissenters really helps people when they're in those ash moments to not mm -hmm. submit to remain, right. you know, to remain independent. And what we see as well, we saw as well with the data is it's not necessarily just a one time, but the consistent, persistent dissenters. So the dissenters Dissent. that keep, keep dissenting. Let me tag one onto that and just, just, just add that maybe what would be also useful is increasing the visibility of dissenters, yes. right? Because it yeah. builds the visible dissenter group size and that ought to have an impact so <coughs> one of the things that you see with these convoys is that if you you wouldn't imagine based on what you're hearing from legacy media that there are would be that many people right. out there 
who would mm-hmm. feel so strongly about this, right? Yeah. Because they're invisible, mostly. They're just carrying on with their day-to-day lives, right? Yeah. But uh, suddenly, they all get together, and they become visible, and it's a large group, and now they've, they're very powerful dissenters. Yeah. And particularly in the case of the, let's say, the convoy, it's, it's physical. Yeah. Mm-hmm. It's out there in the world, and their trucks trucks are big trucks are loud trucks are right. hard to ignore that's why it's it's brilliant <laughs> right and it's you can't just dis- it's hard it's hard to ignore it's hard to dismiss so and even if you, when you are ignoring it it's still it's still going to be there right and i think you you could see it you could you could start to see that you know you could start to see that playing out with the yep. attempts maybe perhaps right. the attempts to ignore to attempts to downplay it's only going to be that's only effective for so long or until it starts not being effective or until it starts being kind of, um, uh, it's, it's, it's counterproductive after a while. Right. Mm-hmm. But, so what else you got for solutions? Okay. So let me see here. I'm just looking at my notes in order to have, in order to have dissenters or one way we have dissenters is with an exchange of information. Okay. Right. So it has to be an opportunity for, so you can do it as an interesting example with, let's say the, the symbols. So you can do it with the symbols. Um, but then having the channels, having the ways to communicate the communicate to the sense. So one of the things with Ash is the epistemological nightmare that happens is a reason for it is because there's this violation of expectations mm-hmm. that when you know, we're, we're all trying to come to an agreement. We're all trying to perceive the world a certain way. And let's say in the event that there is a disagreement, mm-hmm. then we're going to kind of come together and discuss it and hash it out and, and resolve it. And then we can, we can carry on. But in the absence of say, in the, let's say in particular in the Ash study, in the absence of an opportunity to do that. So there wasn't any opportunity in that study for the, for the, for the person in the experiment to say, wait, hold on. Like, can I clarify? Like, can we talk about this? <laughs> yeah. Confederate number one, can you, yeah. like, so what are you seeing that I'm not seeing? Maybe we can work mm-hmm. this out. Maybe we can talk about, we have a dialogue about it. Mm-hmm. Tell me what I'm, tell me what you're seeing that I'm not seeing. Cause maybe I'm wrong. You could be right. And everybody else seems to agree. So are you, is everybody in the, is everybody in the group that's saying yes, all seeing it the same way? Or maybe is there even some variability in that group and you're just not, you're not seeing it. So the lack of an opportunity to have any kind of dialogue or communication creates or reinforces or, or, or sustains this, this conformity. Yeah. Um, and conformity all the, mechanism. all the, uh, the, the suppression and, and censorship and also just removing people with a different view from different working contexts and so on. Right. Um, all of those prevent this free exchange of ideas and information. Mm-hmm. And I think what would actually help is if, people could just start reduce the or eliminate so much of the ethical charge to this whole thing right because part of the big storyline here is that if you don't go along with the crowd on this that's unethical that's immoral yes. if you're, you're not you're conforming just, it's a moral violation yeah moral transgression right and so i think people need to back off on that and say no there are actually legitimate alternative views on this and let's have that conversation there needs to be right. a majority of people who feel that way. <laughs> yeah, I know. <laughs> it's afraid to happen. Yeah. Um, that's right. Okay, I got a few solutions so what here, do you got? Jeff. All right. Yeah. So uh, I would say um, with regard to, let's just, I, I brought that issue of ethics, right? And ethical decision making, which is a key issue in the context of, of uh, these mandates and so on. I would say that what you do is you don't let yourself go with the crowd in the moment. You look at pre, what are the pre-existing long-held views on this, right? So we, for instance, have in Canada a lot of pre-existing ethical codes that are built in uh, to all sorts of medical sciences and bioethics and so on. And we also have, you know, our human rights code and so on. So I would say before, when you're sitting there in the room and you're kind of seeing this dynamic play out, stick to what's historically been well worked out rather than in the moment, just going with, with the crowd. So I would say, right. Look to history. That, that would be, that would be a key solution for me. Would that um, be, if, 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 if possible, would that be like leveraging historical consensus? 
Yes, that's right. Leveraging historical consensus because it's presumably had more time to be worked out. <laughs> or right? yeah, yeah, it's a historical conformity. Maybe that's what the word I was looking for. Yeah, that, yeah, that's that's a very interesting way of thinking about it, right? Because conform to a different, to a bigger group. You, a, a, right, and and avoid working in the heat of the moment. You don't want right. to jettison, you know, uh, centuries, maybe decades of of uh, important consensus work. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> right, in the heat conform of the moment. with the bigger, yeah, with the. <laughs> that's an interesting way of thinking about it. Yeah. I like that. What do you think of that one? Is that, is that a good that's idea a or a bad one. idea? Good no, one. I think okay. that's a, I like, do you know what? So yeah, I, I don't want to, I think I don't, I don't want to miss what you said there that I think is really important too, is um, the, the appeal to these other principles. Yes. So principles specifically that point to things other than going along with, with the group that there's sort of these higher order. Right things you may want to, even so maybe if it's not just factual like historical facts or what have you mm -hmm. but higher order principles or values or things that exist outside of group dynamics or group consensus yeah so there's principles that you don't that don't get swayed by what everybody everybody's doing it so that goes out the window now yeah or everybody's doing it so what i thought was right goes out the window because now i'm just going to now you're untethered and now you're just going along with the whim of the group, whatever that happens to be. And that's, let's say that could be a very dangerous position to be in. Yeah, that's right. That's right. Having something okay. to ground you in. Yeah. I think, th I think that's, if, if I'm correct, that's, that's more what you're saying. Yes, that's right. That's right. And, and scientifically, like that's the way we're trained to think scientifically, right? Because sometimes you might have a knee jerk response to a particular scenario. And then as a scientist, you have to stop that for a moment and then you have to analyze it and think about what's happening, right? And take right. a different stance, more considered stance. And so, uh, so in the context of this, let's say, for example, something like that to make it concrete would be something like trying to pursue truth or get to the bot, like get to uncover the reality or, the, or the, the facts of what's actually happening. Yeah. And that that's right. Conformity processes could get in the way of that. That's right, because they're they're trying to put you in a, in, in a basically an emergency scenario, right? Like right. The, the pressure's on now, make this decision, and then we could talk about this in other in a in a later episode. But then once you make the decision to start to conform, right now you you've you've created um, an inertia um, to to stay conformed for some time, right? So there, so there are these other dynamics that come into play. Um, yeah. so yeah, don't act in the moment, uh, is I think, or don't, don't make these, uh, big decisions like this in a moment to, to, to conform. Okay. Here's another one. I would say, um, when faced with a group that uh, seems to convey a different sense of reality than what you see, you should demand to see the evidence. So I would say in the Ash experiment, and of course participants weren't allowed to do this, but I would say if you're the participant say, okay, let's take out our rulers. Let's right. take out our yep. rulers and, Let's and have do a the conversation about this. Let's get to the yeah. bottom of this. Yeah. Let's see the evidence. I want to, so, you know, when people say, for instance, uh, that the, this, the pandemic is, you know, it's so terrible. Okay. What evidence are you exactly using? You can't just say that. Mm -hmm. What's the exact evidence, right? Mm -hmm. Where did you get that data from? Let's, let's analyze it at that yeah. level. So see, it's interesting um, to hear you say that that wasn't allowed in the ash study, right? Yeah, that's right. Because because <laughs> at that point, when when you're actually holding up the ruler and you see this one is one inch, and uh, the one on the left is one inch, and everybody else is is pointing to the one that's measuring two inches, it's like so clear. Like I, I yeah. suspect that would be the interesting study to do. I'm just I'm when I suspect that uh, like they even go and measure how many people would conform. <laughs> yeah, they still say no. It's clearly yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> right um but anyways but i would yeah. say at least let's let's i'm spinning here let's try that approach <laughs> right um to demand to see the evidence and then here's one more i would say uh that what you should do in uh, especially conditions maybe of some uncertainty and so on is as much as you can try to do your own research and trust yourself right because remember the the dissenters uh, were of, of a few different kinds. Some were very confident. 
Some were just independent and withdrawn. But then there were those ones who had tension and doubt. Mm -hmm. If that's you, I would say, do your research and, and trust yourself a little bit, right? And you may be wrong. This is the key thing. Like, we may be wrong. But going along yes. with the group may also make you wrong, right? So you got to do, you got to trust in yourself and your ability to do research and you can always educate yourself. And I, that's a fun, fundamental principle of mine, right? Is that people can learn, they can go and look at the data, they can think about it. Uh, and uh, a lot of people I think should be able to then trust their judgment on that. See, that just, that just reminded me of something. One of the things, and you, you talk, you mentioned how like there's some people who are independent, weren't phased by it at all. And then there's some other mm -hmm. people who are conflicted. I think one of the things that's helpful or maybe helpful is to normalize that there is this conflict so that if you are having an ash moment, that it's normal to feel like, wait a minute, what's going on here? This doesn't make sense. And in those moments of conflict in that epistemological nightmare, the release to that isn't to just go with the group. Right. The solution yes. then, or the, the, the move then is to seek more information, to look at it more closely in yes. order to, so it's a cue not to capitulate, but it's a cue to, okay, I got to get to the bottom of this. This doesn't That's make right. sense. I That's need to get right. my ruler out. I need to figure this out. And it's normal yeah. to feel that it's normal to feel that way. And it doesn't mean that what you're, what's happening is wrong or what you're thinking is wrong because you have that tension. It's uncomfortable. If it doesn't feel good, it can't be, can't be right. Right. But in this case, like that, that, that doesn't apply. In fact, in fact I'm going to say it's the other way. If you are it's experiencing that tension, yeah. it's a signal. It's a useful signal. That, exactly. It's a, exactly. So it's going to hurt. Expect that it's going to hurt. And then that doesn't mean you should, you should give up on it. Which and me, if you feel pressure, if you feel pressure to make the decision faster, then you know more. maybe you're in a pressure cooker and you got exactly. to keep an eye out for manipulation. You got to exactly. do a manipulation maybe, check. Exactly. Exactly. You're in the high pressure sales room and they're trying to get you to sign on the line. Yeah. Whoa, that's more, re that's more reason to pull back than to go forward. Exactly. Mm -hmm. So I got to, I'm going to spring, a, I'm going to spring a, a game on you now, Dan. Put Dan okay. on the hot seat. Okay. We should do a quick game though, because we're, we're getting along in time here. Yeah, quick this game. will be real. This will be real quick. So the game is who said it? Okay. Somebody in the Ash study or somebody in our contemporary time? Okay. Okay. So these are some quotes. You got to tell me who said it. All right. So was this was this somebody watching a CNN panel or was it somebody in the Ash study? Quote: I first thought something was the matter with me, or most of them. I think that was uh, somebody said that in the Ash study, but it could have been just as, as likely anybody <laughs> watching the mainstream news. That's correct. That was Ash. That was an Ash study. Um, that was an Ash study uh, quote. Here's another one. So, was this somebody discussing the pandemic with their friends and family, or was it somebody in the Ash study? I was sure they were wrong. I just wasn't sure I was right. Oh. That could that certainly a, be the that could certainly be the ash ash type. That's the tension and doubt sort of dissenter, or maybe some somebody who actually conformed. But it could also happen over the dinner table. I don't know. You got me. <laughs> that's an ash. That's an ash participant uh, again. Ah, there you go. Yeah. You may be you may be detecting the pattern. Yeah. So I wouldn't have said I I wouldn't have said what I did if I didn't know I was right. Is that a whistleblower? A nurse whistleblower, or is that somebody in the ash study? I wouldn't nurse have said what I did if I didn't think I was right. A uh, nurse whistleblower. I was an Ash study participant. Oh yeah, <laughs> that was somebody who dissented confidently. Uh, yep. Yeah. Mm. That's so. Yes, interesting, they man. did arouse doubt, but after I thought about it, I still felt I was right. Whistleblower or. I'm going to say Ash. Ash. That's Ash right. participant, yeah. <laughs> yeah, so these are the different things that these guys are saying, these people were saying in these experiments. Yeah. The initial experiment was mostly males, wasn't it? It was all all males. Um, I believe it was all males. Yeah, that's, all males, yeah. If mm -hmm. that's, uh, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Cool. All right. Any final thoughts here, Jeff, before we leave this episode? Yeah, I, I have one more. 
Yeah. I'm going to, I can't, I can't help myself. I got to talk about this because I think I want to end it on a positive note. Okay. Not that we haven't already. I don't know. I can't, I'm not sure, but I think the ash results are even more positive for independence than even a favorable historical analysis would suggest. Mm, Okay. So I think the ash studies themselves actually point to a lot more independence. So one thing to keep in mind is it's not to say conformity doesn't happen and conformity isn't, isn't, isn't happening. Can't get leveraged, but in the ash study, it's sort of that ideal circumstances to have independence. And mm-hmm. I think that's one of the things that's most compelling about it. Right. So you're looking at lines. It's very perceptual. It's out there. You know, it's in the, it's in the real world. You're betraying your senses. There's a clear truth. The group's always wrong. The participants, are, participants always right. So it creates the ideal conditions for independence. And then the, the interpretation is, look, people still conform under these, under these position, under these circumstances. Yep. Look how easy and malleable people are, you know, non-independent, how, how su- easily sub, uh, submissive people can be. However, if you go to the actual, uh, results of Ash's study. Okay. So one of the things I, I'm not sure if we mentioned it, but in the control group, 99% of responses were correct. Okay. Right. So not a hundred percent of people got the answers correct. So there's mistakes that were made. People made mistakes with judging lines, or maybe there was some recording errors perhaps yeah. in, the, in, yeah. the, in the experiment, but there, there wasn't a hundred percent. It was 99%. So specifically people made between um, zero and two errors. Okay. So zero zero and two errors Mm -hmm. when you cut the data so how how it's cut now is it's you made zero errors so completely independent or it's arranged between eight and 12 acts of conformity Mm -hmm. so on the upper end so even in the in the most generous interpretation of ash the conformity that we see is arranged between eight and 12 so it's not complete conformity even in the high conformity case. So remember what I said. So even in the control condition, people made mistakes. So between zero and two errors. So my suggestion is if you, if you spot the independence, those two errors. So in the control case, it's, it's two errors. So there's no motivation. So there's no conformity. So you can have no conformity with upwards of two errors. So if you expand the independence condition, you get more pe- to, between zero and two errors. You're going to get more people who are, who are independent. And if you do that, it becomes 38% of people are completely independent. Ah, so you can move that percentage. If you spot people, the amount of errors people typically do even in the, contr- in the control condition. Right. And if so, so that's one interpretation. So, and maybe you could push back on that, be different interpretations, but I think that's a fair analysis. So if you spot people, the typical errors, it's 38% are independent, not the, not the 24. Right. That's quite a big difference, right? Yeah. So, so yeah, what, what you're saying is you can, if you look at the data a different way, you can essentially, um, reframe the story as one being supporting more independence. Right. Yeah. So it doesn't mean there's still not the conformity. Yeah, but there's just much more independence. So with just this conformity ideal situation for independence, you're seeing, I think, more independence than historically the interpretation has has been uh, suggestive of. Yeah, the other thing, the other thing I'll point out is you can kind of cut it the other way. So initially, the the cut is 100% independent is zero errors. If you took that strict definition and applied it to conformity, namely perfect conformity is 100% submission. Yeah. So you go with the group every single time. You don't defect one time. Guess what the percentage of people who are 100% conformists are? 5%. You got it exactly right. Are you we serious? Didn't we didn't talk about this at a time. <laughs> 5%. <laughs> you got it. I yeah. passed the test. Oh my goodness. Six, <laughs> six out of 123. That's flying colors. That's unbelievable. There's going to be some uh, suggestions I am of collusion thinking. here. I, I am thinking on the fly. Yeah. yeah. 
five percent. Yeah. So you could have a very different story. So if you take the same categorization rules and just reverse them. Yeah. So be strict with the conformists and a bit looser, but fair with the non non conformists, the independents. Mm -hmm. You get 38% being independent and only 5% conforming. Right. I think that's a very, very different story historically and what, what it says about people. It would suggest that people are able to be independent. Yes. Um, even even in the face of a lot of pressure from the group. Exactly. So so that that's and interesting. And to be fair, to bring it back to the to the to convoy, I think that's what we're seeing. Right. Right. And this is bare bones, right? This is just conformity. This isn't talking about all the other levers. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. The obedience. So it's not doing ash, but saying, okay. You got to say which line it is, but if you don't agree with the group, we're going to kick you out of school. Yeah. Yeah. And this, this uh, brings things back to the way, uh, and when we've talked about this before, um, outside of the show as well, uh, that there's been this bias in the way that this topic has been presented, right? Now, always kind of emphasizing the conformity emphasize aspect. Emphasize the conformity. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Downplay the and, independence, emphasize the conformity. Yeah. Yeah, and people should should be aware. I think generally <clears throat> that textbooks, um, you know, they're they're often providing a narrative, and so there will be over time in textbook descriptions of certain studies a certain degree of sharpening and leveling of the information. And you know, because we had talked about this before, I actually looked uh, at some papers on this, <clears throat> and there's an interesting paper um, that appears in Current Psychology. And the title of the paper is, get this, <clears throat> Education or Indoctrination, Ooh. the Accuracy <laughs> of Introductory Psychology Textbooks in Covering Controversial Topics and Urban Legends about Psychology. Mm. And it's a, it's a very interesting read, but here's a little segment from the discussion section. Um, our results indicate that, by and large, introductory textbooks have difficulty accurately portraying <laughs> controversial topics with care or in some cases simply avoid covering them at all Mm. such results indicate that readers of introductory textbooks may be unintentionally misinformed on these topics given that the misinformation contained generally hewed toward presenting contested research as more consistent generalizable to socially relevant phenomena and higher quality than it was we mm-hmm. believe that these errors are consistent with an indoctrination, however unintentional, into certain beliefs or hypotheses that may be dear to a socio-politically homogenous psychological community. Listen to that! Wow. Bam. <laughs> you may even make the I can make you can make the case too that it's not even just controversial topics. Yeah, that's right. That's right. Across the board, even right. Yeah, because wow. because scientists are biased. They're there's a selection of certain socio-political demographics that are overrepresented in academia, and those will bleed into the textbooks, right? And so, but that's just reality. I think anybody who denies that is just like a reality denier. Yeah. Um, well, speaking of, well, speaking of that, even like so, even to apply it to a non-controversial topic, which I would say conformity isn't that controversial. There's mm-hmm. uh, there's research from it's pretty old research, 1990s, um, friend. Uh, friend at all maybe we can put it up um in the in the comments or something um they looked at ash specifically with this lens and what they found was over time there was an increasing emphasis on conformity and decreasing emphasis on independence in the presentation of ash studies in introductory to psychology textbooks so they looked at intro to psych textbooks from somewhere between the 1950s and 1980s and they found that there is this distortion in the presentation of Ash, Ash to emphasize conformity and de-emphasize independence, and that that was a tendency that actually increased over time. Yeah, and this isn't a topic that's I, like, historically, let's say, isn't. I don't know if you'd put it in the top uh, top list of controversial subjects. I don't know. Yeah, exactly. It shouldn't be contra- controversial at all. Um, yeah, I don't. I don't but think, yeah, you, you it, get this. I don't think it would be a sensitive topic. But yeah. Yeah. 
And, and again, I, I think I, I remember even learning about this phenomenon when I was an undergraduate in one of my classes, actually. I think the term they refer to it is sharpening and leveling. What you're doing is you're taking some details and the inconvenient smooth aspects, you yeah, smooth it out. Great, and, yeah. and the ones that the weak effects that are consistent with the story you amplify. Right. And yeah. that's, but this is a, uh, this is actually a regular part of, you know, education and, uh, and the scientific enterprise when things are summarized and so on. So you know, I'm sure we've done this ourselves when we present, right? We emphasize certain things and we de-emphasize certain things. Mm -hmm. So it's just, a, it's just a, a, a part of background reality of dealing with these sorts of issues. And we just have to be aware of them, yes. right? So that way... Um, and I think it speaks to a meta, a meta message in all this is what's happening when, when people are talking about science and let's yes. say trusting the science, that there are these ways these tendencies let's say these biases these distortions that could happen and let's say just to bring it back to bring it back to ash because it's, it's very much on the top of my mind right now when you're looking at something that seems relatively straightforward not really complicated we're not talking about some elaborate predictive model for example that requires all this computational power and all these assumptions and all this complex math we're looking at something like percentages so in the case of Ashley, a percentage of people who did something or didn't do something or a range of percentages. And in that, you can cut those percentages so many different ways to tell yes. so many different stories. Yeah. It's still the same data. The data is not changing. What's changing is what gets emphasized, what gets left out, what gets smoothed, what gets, what gets leveled. Yeah, and that's right. It's You can pick and choose or decide or, you know, distort or what what have you um and you're not you're not changing the numbers numbers are the same so we're not yes. talking about data manipulation no is it 70 percent or is it 30 percent 70 percent said this or did 30 percent not say that yeah so for example what you could do is you could take infections or, or po let's say positive tests on uh, on a measure call those cases, right? So you're just characterizing the whole thing differently now. It's mm -hmm. it's all the same data. So somebody else might say, well, those are just test positives, but none of these people are sick. So they don't they don't count into the the numerator of our ratios, right? They're not a case. So like back to that issue, right? So yeah. I think you're right. We we see that being done in the communication of science, um, just in regular uh, scientific uh, industry, but also, especially in this whole pandemic scenario, yeah. the numbers get shown in different ways uh, in order to support different types of narratives. Yeah. So let's say to bring it back in. So you can you can create these categories with this relatively simple data too, right? Yeah. So you say people who are independent fit this category of percent, zero percent only. Yes. Conformists, broader category, anywhere between 80 and 100%. Yeah. And it, the categorization or the use of categories applied to these numbers can change, let's say, the interpretation or the significance of, totally. of the data. Something you see very recently speaks to this. Some data just came out of Alberta is the percentage of cases in hospitals, deaths, um, based on status. So what, what, signifies or what denotes vaccination status so okay well mm. if you have the vaccine you're fully vaccinated you're in this you're in this group if you're you haven't received it then you're in this other group but when you look at the notes you look at the definition of what fully vaccinated means it means somebody who's got gotten the full doses but then after 14 days two from weeks after their dose yeah which two means Mm -hmm. If you get the dose and you're within two weeks, you're not in the vax category, you're in the unvax category. So suppose you have a heart attack, that heart attack belongs to the unvaccinated now. Unvax, exactly. <laughs> Even though, let's say, they vaccines have been technically received. So the categories change, the definitions change. The numbers yep. are still the numbers, but the labels and how it gets cut and how it gets sliced changes. And you can, you can have a very different emphasis or story based on based on these definitions. So it doesn't have to be this complicated manipulation of data. It could just be very simple slicing of percentages, different ways, categorizing different ways. Yeah. <clears throat> so it's, it's, Ash has lessons all the way through it. 
And that's right. Even on uh, basic <laughs> issues of, of interpreting scientific findings and how exactly. they are actually used yep. to support different views. So yeah, fantastic. Okay, Jeff. All right. I, I think this is, I think we've done enough work for this episode. Let's, uh, <laughs> let's call it quits here. What do you say? That's, I agree. Good. Yep. Okay. Good place to well, end. We'll talk to you later. All right. See you then. All right. Bye.